Hi, it's Dwight Mahalitz. I'm a president of Effective Managers. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to working with you today and to go over with you the top 12 business fallacies in two minutes each. Uh, so this is uh, the webinar for uh, December 10th and uh, we're getting underway now. As I mentioned, we'll uh, hold this to a maximum of 30 minutes. So the first uh, question that we have is, um, is the one that I always like to start with uh, in these is, is sort of the big question to, uh, to, to position the, uh, the topic for the day. So the question I think that we need to start with today is what is a fallacy uh, and, and why can it hurt your organization? Uh, we have many best-selling management books that are out there. Uh, there are grand experiments that are launched uh, with a lot of fanfare. Uh, people from with in their ivory towers uh, from on high come up with those good ideas. And, and these early successes that individuals have often start to carry with them some kind of panache that they're, uh, they're this great solution to, uh, to business problems that individuals have. And, and the problem is, is that uh, in uh, many cases we, we just can't uh, we can't uh, we can't really expect that what works in one organization is going to work in other organizations. And I, if, if I had one message today, that would be the takeaway message: is that what works for one organization won't work for other organizations, and we really need to think about how we can uh, how we can work together in those areas. So the definition then of a fallacy, it's a, a mistaken belief, especially one based on, uh, on, on an unsound argument. And my premise is that the unsound argument in many of these things is that something that works in one place may not work in other places, or there's a fundamental you know, misunderstanding about what the intent of, uh, of uh, the business practice is, and therefore it doesn't apply in, uh, in that situation. So for today's approach, uh, I have a standard approach for them. We have 12 fallacies that I've identified over time. Uh, the first uh, step that I will have is, uh, is to outline what a fall the fallacy is and why it's a fallacy, in my opinion. And then uh, we'll have a second slide for each one, which is the key takeaway. So, uh, so I'm going to try, as I said in my pro uh, promo for this, uh, is to do each one of the uh, business fallacies in uh, in two minutes or less. So, uh, so, uh, so let's see uh, how I do on it. I actually have myself a bit of a timer here, so uh, so I'll try to keep myself on schedule uh, for for today. So the first uh, business fallacy is that there's only one right answer. Uh, most managers are accountable for making decisions, and in fact, by very definition, a manager is accountable for making decisions. Uh, and, and the fallacy here can be that a manager spends too much time and too much effort looking for that one right answer. Uh, so they're looking for some way to be able to arrive at a solution. Very often this is rooted in the fact that accountability is not clear in organizations. So to the extent that accountability isn't clear, the individual may not have the, feel they have the authority to be able to make the decision that needs to be made. But whether they do or not, uh, the situation often comes up that a manager will be seeking to find that one magic answer, the solution that is going to answer the problem and when it's implemented solve the problem in the organization. And the reality is is that in organizations there are so complex that there very seldom is that one right answer that's going to solve the uh, problem for the situation. So the time that a manager spends in seeking after and trying to find this one right answer can delay the decision making process to an extent where the environment overtakes uh, the uh, situation and the decision is uh, is taken out of the manager's hands. In other words, they no longer have the ability to make the decision because events have moved on. So, so that 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 uh, seeking for the best available answer can, in fact, be counterproductive because it puts the manager in a situation of not being able to uh, to make a decision. So, so the. Uh, the, uh, the, the takeaway that I would have for this one then is that it's better to make a decision with the best information that's available than to delay a decision until events overtake you and put you in a situation uh, that will, will force your hand in, in one way or another. Well, we did all right on the first one. We did it in, in our two minutes. So the, um, the second uh, is um, it fallacy that, that I see in organizations is that... Um, 
if there's a vacancy uh, in a team, so the manager, uh, the manager of a team uh, creates a vacancy, the manager of a team leaves and creates a vacancy, uh, that the solution is to uh, promote the best performer in the team to be the new manager of the team. And, and that's a fallacy for, for a couple of reasons. Now, the most important one to bear in mind is that, is that work in each level of an organization is different in the nature of the complexity of that work. So uh, the manager of a team needs to be able to work at a more complex level than, than, uh, than the person that's on the team. So to take the simplest example, at the front line of an organization, the people who are the workers, the day-to-day -day workers, they follow a procedure to get their work done. The, the, uh, the, the manager of that team needs to have a diagnostic capability to understand that procedure, to understand the work of the workers, and figure out how to improve those processes. So, so, so the complexity uh, goes out further in time and requires a, a different level of problem-solving capability to do the work. And that should, if the organization is designed properly, work all the way up the organization. So the risk in uh, promoting someone who is the best on the team is that you're taking the individual who is the absolute best, you know, suited for the work that they're doing at, at that level. If you promote them to the manager, you may, in fact, uh, following the Peter principle, uh, promote them to their level of incompetence. In other words, they will not have the problem-solving capability that they need to work at that next level in the organization. So the takeaway is that uh, candidates for any vacant position must be assessed against the requirements for the position, not based on the, uh, the work experience that you've had them in the previous area. And there are, there are three, uh, I talked about problem solving capability, but we also have to talk about knowledge and skills and application. The, um, the third uh, fallacy that we have and that I'd like to address today is senior executives can manage themselves. Uh, this most often happens at the top of an organization. So the CEO uh, has a senior management team and uh, says to him or herself, these people have been around a long time. They have a lot of experience. They're really good at what they do. They don't need me to manage them. Uh, they can go ahead and, and, and do their work. Uh, the flaw in this is that managerial work does need to take place at every level in the organization. So management work is more than having the team meeting where you agree at decisions. Management work includes all of the elements of, uh, of delegating the work in very precise terms, setting context for the work so that everybody in the organization and each individual really understands the context within which they will do their work, giving them feedback, uh, establishing a feedback loop to make sure that they understand the work, uh, monitoring uh, against that work as it's taking place. Now certainly at the head of the organization, the CEO does not need to spend as much time managing, nor be as, no, certainly not to be a micromanager, so not, not spend as much time or, or be as, uh, as uh, micro in terms of managing individuals as you would have to be on the front line, for instance, but nev nevertheless, you cannot not manage those individuals. So it's really important to bear this in mind, so that leading a team does require uh, solid managerial work at all levels and in fact it needs to start at the CEO so that you have a very solid link from the board all the way down to the front line of the organization in terms of wanting, uh, uh, understanding what you're accountable for, the assignment of resources, the setting of context and, uh, and adding value to the work of, uh, of individuals at each level in the organization. So, so there is no such thing as a self-managed individual because the work of the manager is in fact to understand uh, all of the work that they are accountable for, chunk it up, delegate it down in the appropriate pieces, and, and then ensure that it is happening in the appropriate way. The fourth, uh, the fourth fallacy that we'd like to cover off today is that employees should be empowered. Uh, this one I find one of the most troubling because it is a statement of fact uh, that employees should be empowered. And yet somehow in organizations, it's been interpreted, not in all organizations, but in most organizations, it's been interpreted in a way that is counterproductive. Uh, and, and what happens is, uh, it's similar to the point that we made in, in the last fallacy, is that the managers um, 
quotation marks imp imp empower uh, their direct reports, and in doing so, they feel that they no longer have to manage them. So they're empowered to make decisions, so I need to spend less time meeting with them, spend less time delegating to them, spend less time monitoring them, and so on. And the point that uh, I would make that I, that I feel very strongly about is that, in fact, empowerment comes about as a result of uh, good managerial work, not instead of good managerial work. And that good and managerial work uh, covers the things that we've talked about, setting context and boundaries for the work and the nature of the work, setting very clear uh, delegated accountabilities for what's expected over the period of time, ensuring that the appropriate resources are in place. And once all of that is set up, then the employees are in a situation where they can use their judgment to make decisions and to take initiatives that are consistent with the um, uh, with the direction that the manager would like. So that is true empowerment in terms of having the freedom to use the capability uh, to do your job to the best of your ability, but within a boundary that has been set uh, by the manager. Because without that boundary, then everyone can, with best intentions, start pulling the organization in, in different directions as opposed uh, to working together in a concerted way uh, to do what is necessary. So, uh, so the takeaway from, from this one is that uh, we need to create an environment of empowerment for your team, uh, and that does take a lot of hard managerial work. The, uh, fifth, the, um, the fifth fallacy that I'd like to cover off today is, uh, is with regard to self-managed teams. So in the last fallacy, we talked about uh, managers managing themselves. I guess that was two back, actually, and then empowerment. Uh, but, but this one I see uh, almost rampant in organizations where, where uh, a project team, for instance, is, is, is put together uh, or, or in another organization, um, under sometimes under the banner of holacracy is put together where, where the team uh, is given uh, the uh, output requirements and then told to uh, to manage themselves um, uh, this uh, this can uh, can particularly happen at more senior levels in the organization where people where people figure that uh, where managers figure that uh, that the team can figure it out uh, but the issue is unless you have one individual that is accountable for the output of that team. Uh, it's like the slide that I have up here. It's like it's like a ship without a rudder. So there's a tremendous amount of churn that is created in the organization where individuals need to to uh, work together, to negotiate, to try to figure out who's going to make the decisions, how they're going to make the decisions, uh, how they're going to allocate the resources, how much time should be spent on things. All of these things, rather than than, than being part of context that is set by manager, uh, need to be negotiated and, and worked through. So as a result of that, uh, the accountability for, for the team, uh, team starts to, uh, starts to uh, uh, diffuse itself over time. Um, so I think that's what I had to say on that one. Um, so, so in summary, the takeaway for this is that self-managed teams will, will work for a period of time because people do have uh, good intentions. People will struggle and, and, and try to uh, come up with output that is helpful. But over time, uh, results will start to taper off because over time, without that context and, and direction and link back to the strategy that a manager can bring to the team, uh, the, the, the vision for the direction in which they need to do their work will, uh, will become diffused and they will not be as successful as they could be if they had a manager. Oh, this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, the uh, sixth fallacy that I want to address today is, is flat organizations. Um, and, and this is rampant in the literature, uh, in the managerial sciences literature, uh, particularly now that flatter organizations are better. Um, and I think it comes from the fact that, uh, that over the last couple of decades, a lot of been, work has been done, particularly in the large legacy organizations that over time have built up too many layers uh, in their organizations. And in the building up of those too many layers, uh, what has happened is that they in fact, have become less productive than they could and less effective than they could uh, because they do have too many layers of, uh, of management. So they, uh, they removed layers from the organization, and in the removing of, the, uh, of those layers, they ended up with a more productive organization. So the word on the street becomes uh, flattening your organization is, is a good thing to do. Uh, the issue is is that if you take that and, and apply it uh, whole as bolus to any other organization, it's very easy 
easy to create a situation where you're removing layers from the organization that are actually necessary for the successful management of uh, of that uh, of the of the organization it links back to some of the other fallacies where you do need to have in place a system where the strategy is translated and delegated all the way down the organization in meaningful terms to each manager uh, at each level of the organization if you're missing a layer in the organization the ability to appropriately I call it chunking up, chunk up these, 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 uh, these deliverables or these goals into meaningful tasks that can be delegated down to the next level is, is missing. So you're creating actually gaps in the organization where, where real work uh, uh, that is um, uh, at the level of complexity of that missing layer of management is, is just not getting done. And in fact, this can have an adverse quality on, uh, on the uh, adverse effect on the quality of the organization because you're not having the appropriate level of or, or oversight on that on that next level down so so the uh, so the takeaway from this one is that that layers really do exist in an organization uh, for a purpose and that purpose is to do let work of a, of a certain level of complexity uh, that needs to be done at that level of the organization both both for value-added work so output uh, from the organization uh, into the environment, but also in terms of delegating work and ensuring that work is delegated appropriately down down the organization. So, uh, so we can't unilaterally remove those uh, those positions without uh, without negative consequences. The um, seventh fallacy that I'd like to talk is really the opposite of the previous one, and that is about command and control structure works. Um, and, and this is almost the, the other end of the spectrum from the flat organization. And, and believe it or not, I do see organizations that, that stu still do believe this. So you have someone that is at the top of the organization and believes firmly that they are the one that have the ability and the, the skill uh, to make all of the decisions for the organization. And they, you see my iron fist here. They rule with the iron fist throughout the organization to make sure that everyone does exactly what is needed at the right time, in the right way, and so on. Um, in very small organizations, this might work. It probably wouldn't be a very happy place uh, for the organization to work, um, but it um, but it would be uh, it, it could work in smaller organizations. But as the organization gets larger and there is more complexity of work and there's larger spans of control in the organization and more people to manage, uh, it simply becomes unwieldy for the one person at the top of the organization to be able to get all of the information that's required, uh, weigh that against all of the options that are available, uh, make a decision, and then communicate that decision back down the organization for, uh, for the results to take place. So the slide I have is that too much command uh, usually results in, in too little control is, is spot on because by, by creating these filters through the larger and necessary complexity of the organization, uh, the one who uh, would want to control the organization is, is, is no longer able to do it. So, so the key is is that uh, is that uh, command and control organizations are too slow and too cumbersome uh, to uh, compete in, in today's world. And this is aside from all of the other obvious uh, difficulties that we have in terms of uh, people people not feeling uh, motivated, uh, people not feeling included, uh, people not feeling empowered to use their capability to make decisions and and to make, make uh, and to take initiatives uh, within their areas. The eighth fallacy is that managers should work out their differences. And the thinking goes something like this. I, I'm a manager and I've got a team and my team are senior people. They're adults. They're paid a good salary. And therefore, if they have any uh, differences of opinion, they should work it out uh, and not come uh, running to me and uh, bother me with their uh, problems. Um, and this is uh, disconcertingly uh, common in organizations. The, um, the, 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 the reason it's a fallacy is, uh, is not because people can't work out their problems. Of course they can. Um, uh, people are adults, and by working together, they can try to find a solution that will be mutually acceptable to both of them. The issue is, is what is the cost to the organization of them having to do that? So every time 
I, I in this part of the organization have a difference of opinion with you in that part of the organization, uh, we enter into a conflict situation about trying to figure out what's best. And rather than being able to work within a common framework of clearly delegated accountability and authority so that we know what our role is with respect to each other and we understand uh, our accountabilities and authorities with respect to each other and we know how to resolve the issue by escalating it to our managers higher in the organization if necessary. So, so what what, what having that clarity of accountability and authority for how work flows across the organization actually removes that conflict, uh, conflict and allows individuals to collaborate and to spend their energy on positive things for the organization instead of butting heads and, and creating churn in the organization in, in, in ways that are not necessary and certainly, uh, certainly not appropriate. So, so managers can work out their differences, uh, but why should we put them in a position uh, where, where, we, uh, where, where they need to do that? In fact, in our research, we find that uh, over half of the managers that uh, participate in the Effective Managers Survey report that they experience ongoing situations of conflict in their organization. And, and that's just not acceptable in terms of, uh, of meaningful and appropriate work in, in today's organizations. Uh, the ninth uh, uh, the ninth fallacy that I'd like to cover off today is that successful managers are the most effective managers. And this is an interesting one. This was actually a, a, a finding for me when I was uh, doing the research for the effective managers research, the, the uh, background reading. And uh, studies have shown that successful managers, uh, as measured by promotability, so, so those managers in the organization who are promoted tend to be those managers who are very good at networking, uh, very good at interactions with their peers, very good at, at, at uh, networking upwards and creating relationships and, uh, and, and being positively perceived by, uh, by those higher in the organization. So these are all good things to have, uh, but, the, but the issue is, is that the effectiveness component, how well do I meet those objectives that have been delegated to me and how good am I at, uh, at actually performing the actions necessary for, for achieving that work often get, uh, get uh, sidelined in terms of the importance of, uh, of uh, promoting people in the organization. So I'm not saying that, that uh, managers promoted shouldn't be good at networking and shouldn't be good at peer communications. Absolutely they should, but let's not forget that aspect of the work which is also critically important, and that is what are the skills and knowledge that I need to be able to do this work? What is the problem-solving capability that I need to be able to work at that next level of uh, complexity in the organization, and how much do I really uh, value uh, working at that next level of the organization so that I will full, uh, apply my full capability to the work. So, uh, so applicants to positions really need to be measured against that full suite of capabilities and attributes that are, uh, that are necessary for success at that next level and not focus in on, on too much on, on in terms of, uh, of, of how well they relate to others and, and how well perceived they are uh, in terms of, uh, of their relationships in and across the organization. So the, uh, the, tenth, um, the tenth fallacy that I'd like to cover off today is that committees can be held accountable. And again, this is something that, uh, that I see in organizations all the time, a committee or a task force or, um, or um, um, some other formal body is put in place and, and is made accountable for a process, uh, perhaps the, um, the, um, the allocation of, uh, of capital investments. Uh, it might be uh, the, uh, some of the nature in terms of, of, of the way other kinds of processes are set up in the organization, or it could be for the process itself. So, so, so a team is put in place in some way and, uh, and, and then held accountable for the results. And it's similar to many of the other fallacies, but the key issue here is that in organizations, unless one individual is held accountable for doing their work, uh, no, uh, no, in, no individual is accountable. So if, unless one person's accountable, no one's accountable. And the example, somewhat lighthearted example I like to give is, is think about the uh, kitchen in any organization that you've been in, uh, where the, the, there's the sign over the sink and says that each, everyone is, is responsible for washing their own dishes. And, and how well does that work? Uh, and, and the, you know, anywhere I've ever worked, I, I know that it just, 
doesn't work. So, so we really do need those single points of accountability in organizations. And once those single points of accountability in organizations are identified, then let that individual within the authority that they have for their position recruit and identify and put in place whatever network is necessary to bring people together to understand the issues, to get their input, to consolidate uh, feedback from them, uh, and then with all of that input make a decision or make a recommendation higher in the organization. So the committee really isn't necessary because the individual that's accountable for the results will bring together the people that are necessary to make the most appropriate decision in, in the organization. So, so formal structures uh, that are set up in, 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 in parallel to the organizational hierarchy are counterproductive. Use the organizational hierarchy that is in place, identify the point of accountability for the work that needs to be done, and then empower that person with, uh, with the appropriate authority to bring people together uh, in appropriate ways to make the uh, decisions that are necessary. So we're, uh, we're, we're, we're moving along. We're now up to the 11th uh, process. It looks like I'm uh, exceeding my time, so I'm going to have to step it up a notch here. So the 11th process, the process manager is accountable for the process. Uh, this is a fallacy because uh, the process manager is not in a position in the organization where he or she is going to be able to uh, make decisions and decide improvements or changes to the process across the whole organization. So the process manager can be held accountable for monitoring, for providing services, for training, for seeing how well things are doing, for suggesting improvements and so on, but one needs to find in the organization that individual who has the authority to decide and direct across the entire process before you can find the accountable manager. That doesn't mean that person has to do all the work. You need the project manager to do all of those things that the project manager does, but let's not pretend that the project manager can be held accountable for the process. So by definition then, any process that goes across the entire organization would be the accountability uh, of the CEO because it's only the CEO that can decide and direct all of those who would have input into the processes. So only the manager who has the account of authority to decide and direct every individual position in, in the process has the authority uh, to uh, change the process and therefore is accountable for the process. So the twelfth and final fallacy is that performance management systems should be objective. Um, th this, this is, uh, I think, a well-intentioned uh, intention of most HR systems to, to try, try to bring fairness uh, into performance management systems. But in reality, if, uh, if we're going to uh, be fair, we cannot be objective. And the reason for that is that the way in which individuals do their work is going to be very, very different depending on the environment within which they work. So you can have two individuals in two different parts of the organization given almost exactly the same uh, deliverable that they're accountable for, and yet one runs into all kinds of problems and still achieves target. The other one uh, has new organizations and new clients and everything, and they're working in a very easy uh, territory, um, so they wildly exceed their target. Well, which one uh, actually did better work? It may be the one that just barely met their target by working 20, you know, 24 seven kind of thing to overcome fierce obstacles compared to the one uh, who, who exceeded the target but had a fairly easy time of it because of circumstances. So only the manager is situated to be able to weigh uh, the situation of those two individuals and then based on that, give fair and timely feedback to the individuals because the fair and timely feedback is in fact the key differentiator between uh, in, in performance management systems. That is what helps to, uh, to improve the productivity of the organizations. So in, in summary, the summary is that uh, everything in moderation, including moderation, this is one of my favorite Oscar Wilde co quotes, so, so it's, uh, uh, it's true of everything in organizations, so no matter what the uh, issue is, is that we're, uh, we're working on, is that uh, there will be uh, two extremes which we can gravitate towards. Often, life ends up being in a pendulum. This can happen in organizational change as well. The question is, how do we find that balance between uh, those two alternatives that we as managers in the organization have and, and how we can move forward to doing that? 
So I did have a, a couple of extra slides, but I've, I've used up my 30 minutes uh, on those, so I'm just going to flip through those slides. Uh, you have them in, in your deck, and they're pretty well self-explanatory. What I do want to say is, is let you know that we have a change management special webinar next week. Uh, please do uh, sign up for that. It's going to be very interesting in terms of looking at what are the key factors that we need to address in, uh, in change management, and how can you, in any major change initiatives that you have in the next year, uh, work those through. So in closing, uh, please do check out the website for uh, free resources. You can sign up for my newsletter there. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, please document them. There will be a three uh, a three uh, question survey coming up when we uh, when we finish this webinar. I would very much appreciate you taking a minute or two to complete those. And if you have any questions, you uh, you can uh, send them through to me either in that mechanism or or drop me an email. Uh, follow me on Twitter for daily tips and um, and uh, if you'd like to connect on LinkedIn would love to do that so thank you very much for your time today we have gone one minute over sorry about that but I really appreciate your time and and looking forward to uh, to interacting with you um, in the coming months take care bye hi I'm Dwight Mahalitz president of effective managers thank you so much for downloading the webinar I hope that you enjoyed it and will find it useful Feel free to check out other parts of the website for interesting downloads. Most are free, some are at a nominal charge, but I'm sure you'll find lots of interesting tools there and things that can help you be more effective. And in fact, that's what my job is. My job is to help you, uh, help your organization be higher performing. The bottom line is that I want to start where you are, understand your problem, and provide services that can help you solve that problem and implement a solution as quickly and as effectively and as efficiently as possible. Give me a call, drop me an email, I'd love to hear from you, talk about your situation and see if there's anything that we can do together. Thank you.